I recently posted on Twitter that according to an epidemiologic study in Jordan, if you have a bad diet in the top quartile, the top 25% of pro-inflammatory food intake, you have a 10 times increased risk of getting multiple sclerosis. But I admit at the time I tweeted that, I didn't read the full publication, but now I have. And let's take a look together. I promise you'll learn something important in this video. And remember the adage, don't judge a book by its cover. Now, it's always been my philosophy that diet research is different from other research in the sense that we don't need definitive evidence to recommend broccoli. We don't necessarily need randomized controlled trials because after all, you have to eat something and the risk of a good diet is generally low unless it's a weird, very restrictive, perhaps very expensive diet. It's just different from scientific evidence for dangerous chemotherapy drugs. Nonetheless, it's still possible to go wrong. And of course, on my channel, I've mentioned various epidemiologic studies, such as the holism study, and often the effect sizes are relatively small, 1.5 fold differences, two fold differences. So this 10 fold difference in multiple sclerosis risk really stuck out at me. So let's take a look at the details of the study. The study was done in Jordan, the country, and they had a case control design. So they looked at people with MS and compared them and their diet to people without MS. They looked at people age 20 to 60, which is most people with MS, mean age of onset of 30. And they had 541 people with MS versus 607 controls without MS. The mean age was 42. And they excluded people with certain medical conditions such as cancer, which could potentially affect diet, motor neuron disease, chronic kidney disease where people have certain dietary restrictions, and of course pregnant women because it could bias the study. And because Jordan is a primarily Arabic-speaking country, they use the Arabic Food Frequency Questionnaire to assess dietary intake. And then they plugged in that information to software called ESHA's Food Processor Nutrition Analysis, and they used it to calculate something called the DII, the Dietary Inflammatory Index, which is supposed to be a measure of how inflammatory the diet is. Is this a legitimate medical concept? We'll take a look at it in just a moment. And the outcome was a correlation between the DII and risk of getting multiple sclerosis using logistic regression, and they adjusted for covariates known to affect risk of MS, such as age, sex, body mass index, and smoking status. I'll give a little background on the study. So Jordan is this small country in the Middle East, north of Africa. Historically, MS was very rare in Jordan. The prevalence was low, but this study was done in Amman, Jordan, which is the capital, and the prevalence is approximately 2,600 to 1, roughly one-fifth the prevalence in countries such as the United States. There are prior observational studies in various countries suggesting some link between diet and the risk of getting multiple sclerosis. To give a few examples, there's a case control study in Iran, another country in the Middle East where MS was historically very rare, and they found a higher intake of dairy, seafood, red meat, poultry, vegetables, and fruit and nuts was associated with a lower risk of PPMS, primary progressive MS. This is based on 143 people with PPMS versus 400 controls. This study is a little unusual in that dairy is associated with an increased risk of MS in some other studies, such as the holism study. In a Brazilian cross-sectional study, a higher DII score, which is the same thing we're looking at in this particular study, was linked to higher disability, measured by the Expanded Disability Status Score, the EDSS, although the R value was low, 0.294, but the P value was statistically significant, 0.001, and that's more typical of what we would see in these types of epidemiologic studies, a modest association of dietary consumption and multiple sclerosis. And one of the the reasons for that may be the actual variation in diet in a given country may not be all that large. It doesn't necessarily mean that diet doesn't have a huge effect. Of course, it could, but the association is low, possibly because dietary variation just isn't that large. Now, the crux of the study is the DII, the Dietary Inflammatory Index. Is it actually legit? Well, it's supposed to be an evidence-based
evidence-based way to quantify the effect of diet on inflammation in the body and inflammatory disease. But what they did is they actually took a bunch of different studies. Some of them are clinical studies, even randomized trials. Some of them are observational studies, but some of them are animal studies, even cell culture studies. And they put them all together in this sort of arbitrary algorithm, and they said this is a more inflammatory food, this is an anti-inflammatory food. There are two problems with that. One is that some of the studies, like particularly cell culture or animal studies, may simply not be applicable at all to human inflammatory diseases. Many things look to be significant in cell culture in vitro, but just are not significant in humans with diseases in vivo. Another thing is that MS is not really strongly associated with other autoimmune diseases. It's not associated with lupus. It's not associated with rheumatoid arthritis, and it seems to have a different mechanism of actions. Yes, there are some epidemiologic similarities, like these diseases are more common in young women, but for example, drugs that block TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, though effective in rheumatoid arthritis, actually make multiple sclerosis worse or even cause the disease. So I'd like to see something more specific to multiple sclerosis. Let's just look at individual nutrients and see if there is an association with MS. Of course, the advantage of using the DII is it's very well studied, it's already determined, it's easier to do research. But let's run with it for a moment and see what we find. So here are some examples of individual components of the DII. Here a negative number is good because a lower DII means a less inflammatory diet. So you can see positive numbers are carbohydrates and cholesterol and more calories, eating more of them is bad, whereas eating more fat is bad, but eating more fiber is good and eating more folic acid. Just to give some examples, there's a huge list of micronutrients and a brief summary, some key notable contributors to the DII. Good things would include fiber, vitamin D, very well known to be associated with multiple sclerosis risk, magnesium, niacin, flavonoid, tumor and omega-3 fatty acids, all considered good, which would lead to a lower DII, and the bad things would be trans fats, saturated fat, calories, more calories in general, cholesterol, more carbohydrates, and red meat. And just to show some examples of what the number, the DII score might mean, you can see the range from the minimum of negative 8.87, very good, very anti-inflammatory, to the maximum 7.98, very very bad, very pro-inflammatory, the median is 0.23, right around zero. So any positive number is good, any negative number is bad. The 75th percentile, 1.9, and the 25th percentile, negative 2.36. Again, lower is better, more negative is better. And this is just one prior study published on the DII. You can see there's an association between better diet and lower CRP. This is C-reactive protein. This is a blood inflammatory marker that's associated with various autoimmune diseases and even heart disease. So low CRP is better. Now the negative slope here is misleading. In this particular article, for whatever reason, they used an inflammatory index where a higher number is better. So here they showed a higher inflammatory index, which was good. And just this individual study, not the main study we're looking at. So a negative number actually makes sense here. Now let's move back back to the study we're talking about in Jordan, we'll start with the baseline characteristics of the people in the study. On the left, you see the cases, people with multiple sclerosis. In the right, you see controls, people without MS. You can see the average age was approximately 42, no significant differences there. You can see in terms of body mass index, people with MS were a little bit heavier. Mean body mass index, 26 versus 24.6 in controls. This was a statistically significant differences, but again, we'll account for this in adjusted logistic regression. So it should not bias the study too much. In terms of percentage of people who are males, it was about 31% in both cases and controls. That makes sense because most people with MS are women. The percentage who were obese, 21% in cases versus 10% in controls, again, was different, but they're adjusting for this. And there were more smokers with MS, 25% versus 16%. Now, if we look at the actual scores, on the bottom you see just people with multiple sclerosis. This is relapsing MS, RR, or relapsing remitting MS, and people with 
progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and secondary progressive MS, you can see there weren't major differences in the mean score. Again, positive is slightly bad, negative is slightly good. Now, these aren't huge deviations from zero, but there's some difference. So what is DII versus EDII? DII is just the normal uh, index, the actual value they got in the study. But they also did an analysis where they adjusted it for calorie intake. If you consume more food, you'll consume more bad nutrients, but also more good nutrients. And so it can kind of change the results based on the individual effects of the nutrients. And so when they adjusted for it, all of a sudden people with MS were slightly pro-inflammatory, but adjusted for calories they were slightly anti-inflammatory. Now, in the data we're going to look at, in the result that led to this tenfold increased risk of multiple sclerosis, they use just DII. They did not use EDII. And they explain in the discussion, they did this purely because using DII, not adjusted for total calorie intake, led to stronger correlations, more significant results. And you'll see in a moment, this is a huge problem. So these are the results. This is the money shot. Again, we have cases, people with MS on the left and controls on the right. And these are the individual nutrients being studied. And are there differences between people with MS and the general population? You can see the P value in this column. Now, the very first thing at the very top is calories. And right away, we see a huge difference. People with MS are consuming 1,257 calories per day on average versus around 1,800 for controls. A massive, massive difference, almost 600 calories. Keep in mind that more calories leads to a higher DII, so it's a more inflammatory factor, but people with MS are consuming much less. Now, this causes a huge problem because essentially people with MS are probably eating less food, or at least reporting that they're eating less food. And so they're eating less of everything, less protein, less carbohydrates, but it doesn't really tell you that much about the quality of the diet. Now, it's very well known in nutrition science that what people report that they ate isn't necessarily very accurate. People who are put in hotel rooms and asked to write every sing single thing they've eaten and recorded and calculate the calories often underreport the calories they consumed by around four, 500 calories per day. And of course, a healthy adult eating 1,250 calories per day is gonna start rapidly losing weight. Now, I don't see why there should be some kind of systematic bias for people with MS to be less good at reporting their calorie in intake. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but it definitely affects the results. Because again, it looks like people with MS are eating less of everything, less protein, 67 versus 75. But again, if you adjust for calories, they might be eating a higher protein diet carbohydrates, 148 versus 258. Fiber, about the same, 16.63 versus 16.47. So maybe people with MS actually have a higher fiber diet. Same with cholesterol, they're consuming a little less, 189 versus 195, but adjusted for calories, people with MS are consuming more cholesterol. So it really comes down to the way DII is arranged. If there are more good nutrients that people with MS are eating less of, that could easily outweigh the bad nutrients that they're eating less of, or again, reporting that they're eating less of. So if you look at saturated fat, 18 versus 22, there's a difference. But again, it's just based on total food intake. Same with monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, same with calcium and iron and magnesium. There really aren't huge differences if you adjust for calories. So maybe the researchers should have focused on diet quality rather than something that could be influenced by the total food intake you report. Same with sodium, same with phosphorus. And for people who are watching this video with MS, I'd be interested to know, do you think that you have a lower appetite than the general population? Do you think that maybe the study is accurate, that people with MS just 
eat less calories? I'd love to know. This is certainly not something I've heard from my patients, generally speaking. Now we'll look at some other micronutrients. I circled a few things that look like they could be significant, like vitamin A, vitamin E, and folic acid. It looks like people with MS seem to consume less than controls for these three micronutrients, even out of proportion to the difference in total calorie consumption. Another interesting thing in this study is alcohol. People with MS consume dramatically less alcohol than the general population. 0.29 grams per day versus 1.14. That's about 75% less alcohol consumption for people with MS. Again, comment below if you don't tolerate alcohol or don't drink it for other reasons if you have MS. Now here we can see the total scores. So the DII for people with MS is on average 0 0.70, so slightly bad. I remember zero is approximately new Control, pretty high standard deviation, 1.52. And if you look at controls, it's negative 0.39, so slightly good. So it looks like people with MS have a very slightly worse diet, according to this inflammatory index, than controls. But wait a minute, what if we look at the energy adjusted DII score? All of a sudden, people with MS have a better diet than controls, negative 0.89 versus negative 0.55. So all of a sudden, if you correct for calories, essentially total food intake, people with MS have a better diet. So where exactly did they get that tenfold increased risk of MS number anyway? Well, here it is. So they broke the data down into quartiles. And again, they just used DII. They did not adjust for calories, which has its drawbacks, as I explained very clearly. So quartile one, people with the lowest or best score, less than negative 0.98, people in quartile two from negative 0.97 to negative 0.15, quartile three, and then quartile four, people with the worst diet based on the DII greater than 1.44. And you can see the cases, people with MS versus the controls. And so you can see in quartile one, people with the best diet, there were a disproportionate number of controls suggesting there's a decreased risk of MS if you have a diet in this range. So what they did is they didn't compare quartile four to an average or median diet. They compared it to quartile one. And you can see in quartile four, 229 people with MS versus only 59 controls. Clearly, there's a disproportionate number of people with MS. They weighed that against quartile one, and they came up with this tenfold increased risk. Now, you may ask, is there something in the article, maybe in the supplementary appendix, where they did the same analysis for people with energy-adjusted DII? Absolutely not. It does not appear in the article at all. And my opinion is very clear. This is simply a glitch in the DII score. Essentially, there are more things on that questionnaire that give a positive score than a negative score. And so if you eat less food and less calories, or at least reporting that you ate less food, you end up with a lower score. Again, people with MS didn't necessarily eat a worse diet. They just ate a little bit less food. So I personally do not believe the results of the study, and I found it to be extremely misleading. So this is a very different video than the one I intended on making, but I think it's quite informative that you can't necessarily trust the abstract of the study or something you read on a news site. Unfortunately, you do have to read the entire study, including the methodology section, and you need to have some background in the science behind it. And hey, I'm not a nutrition scientist. I'm not very familiar with the DII score. There are probably some other Easter eggs and other things that I'm not familiar with and not catching just based on my lack of experience. But I still thought it was a good study, and I'm not trying to criticize the researchers. They're looking for correlations. This is not definitive proof anyway, and I wouldn't discourage anyone from trying to eat a good diet. It's just that I'm not convinced based on this particular methodology, at least not this particular uh, research study. But I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Do you consume less alcohol for one reason or another? Do you think you eat less calories? One of the other findings in the study that people with MS seem to eat less total food. Do you keep a particular diet? And what are your results with that diet? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?